Let's do this. Isaac, hello. Hello, Rabbi. Good afternoon. It's so good to see you. Good afternoon to yourself. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you. Are you ready to rejoice and be glad? <laughs> Amen. At any time. Yes, we are. Aren't we all, aren't we all ready, to, ready to rejoice and be glad at all times? Um, sure. I mean, I, I know at all times. I, I know when I read uh, the second Beatitude, uh -huh. blessed are those who mourn. I'm not sure if I was uh, ready to rejoice and be glad. Well, and, leading up to Pesach, it's a time to both, re it's, it's both the season to both rejoice and to mourn, uh, or it's both a remembrance of the mourning and the rejoicing. So in that spirit, yes. Sure. Okay, Isaac. So okay. I, as we said yesterday, you actually read 11 and 12 yesterday because 11 and 12 do feel like uh, one of uh, two verses, one concept. So let's just see the final verse of the Beatitude before, mm -hmm. and then we're like, wipe our forehead, we'll get off this mound, and we'll do some other things. The Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 5, verse 12 Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This feels so different, doesn't it? This doesn't feel like the Beatitudes. But if we were good at counting, what we would see is that there's a famous argument. How many Beatitudes are there? Is there seven? Is there eight? Is there nine? Or if there is my opinion, there's ten. Mm -hmm. There's the Decalogue of Beatitudes parallel, the Decalogue, the Aserah Tadibros, the Ten Commandments of the Old Testament that falls in Exodus and Deuteronomy. So over here, I think it's very, very important that there are 10 verses because this seems like so many different parallels to the Decalogue, to the Ten Commandments that take place in the Old Testament that in the Bible that it was so necessary to hit 10. But I think when people start reading them, they go, hold on, hold on. You know, number verse 12 feels like the ending of 11. Verse 10 feels like a different feeling. Verse 9 feels like um, I love the number 7. It can't really be number 8. So there's all these different opinions. But to me, there's 10 Beatitudes, and there's always going to be 10 Beatitudes. Mm -hmm. Who could that be? Okay. So uh, so I don't know if you have anything to add to that. We could, we could jump right into the verse. Yeah, no, let's let's jump right in. As you said, this look, this sounds very different. It looks very different. The wording is different. The structure, everything everything about this verse feels so different that it feels like it's something, uh, you know, that it's, it's again, it's not, it's not, it's not a blessed are you. Well, when's something the last different. time that you read the Ten Commandments? If you look at the Ten Commandments, there's really long narrative kinds, long commandments, and then you get into six, seven, eight, nine, it says, mm -hmm. don't murder. Don't kill, cannot, you know, and you get, you get, but that's, a a, but that's a commandment, right? That's so, does it have to be law? I mean, that's a, by definition, it says not something. By, so that's a commandment. That just because a text changes the way that it is written, the style doesn't have anything mm -hmm. to do. So, for example, the yes, first of it, if you look at the Ten Commandments, there's actually an argument what the actual Ten Commandments are. While some of them are very clear, the actual first commandment, according to Jewish tradition, is the belief that you have to know there is a God. There's a commandment in Judaism. To know there is a God. And that is actually, uh, according to Nachmanides, the belief is that you have to know that there's a God who took the Israelites out of Egypt. So one will be historical knowledge, or another one will be experiential or philosophical knowledge, depending how you read it. But the point is, most people, when they read, um, I am the Lord your God that took you out of the land of Egypt, they don't view it as a commandment because it's not a commandment. But knowledge of that is the commandment of the Ten Commandments. And therefore, it's a very different structure. So my point is that, number one, all the Ten Commandments aren't necessarily all commandments. Number two, in Hebrew, it doesn't mean Ten Commandments. It means Ten Statements. Mm -hmm. Not even Hebrew is a Sarah's Hadib wrote. It's not the Ten Commandments. So I personally have no problem if you write blessed or cursed or up or down or persecuted. And I still feel that there will be Ten. Okay. So let's, let's dive right okay. in. Rejoice and be glad. Anyone who sees the free, I, I, you know, it's so funny. Um, if you ask a Greek um, interpreter, what does rejoice and be glad mean? They might say, oh, really rejoice refers to this. Glad means this. There's a difference. But any Jew who reads rejoice and be glad in their head, they'll immediately, without exception, in English and Hebrew, might as well, might as well be in, in Spanish. You hear rejoice and be glad, you immediately think of Psalm 118, verse 24. Mm -hmm. you, you can't help it. And Psalm 118, verse 24. This is, is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. 
Yeah, and obviously, you know, and this is such a famous verse for multiple reasons. So, this is the day. So, one thing that we keep focusing on is that when we read the Bible and read the Tanakh in different places, we know what is the day. The day is the day of, of, of the messianic uh, arrival. So much so that a very famous medieval commentator, the Radak, Rabbi David, uh, Rabbi David Kimpley, he says on this verse, he says, in the future, it will be obvious that the marvelous events which are transpiring for the benefit of Israel are supernatural, then everyone will admit this is the day that God has made. How much could the Radak have summarized the purpose of the Ten Commandments of the Beatitudes, then that statement. What an amazing parallel that there's some day that is going to be so obvious to everyone that it's going to be changed. I'm going to say, this is the day. If I had to summarize what Jesus is trying to accomplish on the mound, I would take out that raw doc and I'd read it to everyone. This is the day. This is a different feeling. Maybe the raw doc feels it's supernatural because in Jewish tradition, there's always a very obvious eschatological supernatural change, but Jesus, as we keep talking about, has a different uh, sapiential eschatological uh, opinion, and therefore it's not going to be supernatural, but this is the day. This is the this is the day when he put the spade in the ground, when he stood yeah. in the mountain. So I feel so, that yes. the fact that starts to be glad and rejoice is it's perfect to make that parallel to Psalms. Yeah, so, okay, but in the Psalm story, that's pointing, that's pointing to, that's pointing to the future kingdom. The kingdom of the Messiah. I said, when that comes, rejoice and be glad for this is the day that the Lord hath made. Now, in this context, let, let's come over here. Rejoice and be glad. What I'm so this is more. It, to me, it feels like this is more. This is more of an introduction to what comes after that. Rejoice and be glad for what he's saying. It's not because the Lord made this day, but that's leading up to this. To to at least it's leading up to the um, to the central core or, or or to the core of his claim for your reward is great in heaven, which on the face of it seems very jarring. This is the first time it speaks about reward. So long it's been blessed. Blessed are you, blessed are you, blessed, so on and so forth. Blessing by itself is more holistic. You know, as we discussed, the blessing is more holistic. You, you, you spoke about, uh, what's his name, the term sh sh shalom, shalom, right? The, 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 um, you know. Shalom! Okay, yeah. But here, right, reward in the sense, it seems a bit narrow or it's more specific. And I'm intrigued. Right. So, like, we're, we're, so, saying so we're saying there's a double entendre, though. So, you know, I mean, saying, yeah. yeah. So, do you see any parallels between blessings and reward, and and how, you know, rejoice and be glad because of something which is going to happen to you? Uh, and so, yeah. And that's so, why I felt. Uh, that's why I felt this felt so different. <laughs> it is different, and uh, it is contrasting to the other. So, one thing that we keep seeing throughout the Beatitudes is this pure level of faith, that of the poor in spirit, that of the mourner, that of the meek. And I agree, this is a different attitude. And even if you compare verses uh, 11 to verses 12, you'll get a very, very different attitude. Because in verse 11, you have on my account, because of me, you're only doing because of me. But in, in 12, we see that this idea of the opposite of for its own sake is not for its own sake, for an ulterior motive, for an auxiliary motive, for a reason that benefits you. I like to give charity because I like my name on buildings, an ulterior motive. So what we see here is what I would call a lowly Shema Christianity, a not for its own sake Christianity. And if anything, I agree, Jesus seems to be against that, but there's different ways we can look at it. One way I think is really interesting is that, um, as you are probably aware, Jews, they like to say there's three paragraphs of the Shema. The Shema is the monotheistic, uh, you know, motto that we say every time, every day, twice, at least twice a day, sometimes more, that blessed uh, um, um, hero Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And then we say three paragraphs. What's really interesting mm -hmm. is that the second paragraph is almost identical to the third paragraph. The only difference is the second paragraph, it gives lots of reasons or rewards if you do it. If you go and w wake up and praise God and go and do commandments, I'll give you your reign in your right time. I'll give you your, your, your material rewards. So we see that religion could exist on two different stratospheres, two different levels. One level is the, verse, uh, the, the, the level of verse 11. Blessed you people, you have lots of bad things happen to you, but if you, if you kind of take the pain because for God's sake, 
That's the best way. I, when I see verse 12, when I say, be happy, I, for your reward is great in heaven, I see a lowly Shema Christianity, a Christianity not for its own sake. And again, I, I think Christianity, for the most part, we have to know exists on both levels. The level, this pure level that Jesus is describing in the beginning of the Beatitudes is not something that any human being could ever attain. It's not something that some human beings attain. So much so that some people read this verse 12, oh, this is addressing his disciples. Because we can't even imagine a level that it's addressing a, a prophetic level. We can't imagine a level that, you know, that it, it's happening on these multiple levels. So I think that we have to be able to differentiate in our head, bifurcate this reality between sometimes it's okay if you do things not for its own sake. We spoke out last time, lo lishma, balishma. You do things for the wrong reason, you'll come to it for the right reasons. And I think in the last verse, Jesus opens the door crack for the people who aren't of the purest faith. And I think that's fine. So, okay, so you're saying there are, there are, there are, there are two levels of blessing. One is the blessing, as in the the, high, the, the, the pure blessing from pure intentions, uh, you know, again, or, or the one, blessed the blessed the pure in heart, blessed are the weak, the, the blessed are those who mourn, which is which is too complex, and no person can ever attain can can ever attain all of those in their lifetime. And you're saying this, the, the one below that is the, the the ones which come below that is is um, you know is um, um, which can be obtained, and, and this is and this is the context of the, uh, you know, of the three levels of blessing where you mentioned, right? The, you know, the three, what do you call it? The, the three layers of blessing. The, the three. The, I'm just saying, there's the three paragraphs of, of the Shema. And the first two paragraphs have the same verses from mm -hmm. the Bible, but the Bible changes it a little bit that it mentions the reward. And some in Yeshaya Leibowitz likes to point out that you can have someone who helps a person because God said so. For no ulterior motive, or you have to help a person because you want to get something out of it. So what we see in this verse is rejoice and be glad. Inherently, you get an emotional, hedonistic, but emotional satisfaction. Satisfaction. You should be happy. You should be glad. And what if you're not happy? You're glad. What if you're just mundane? What if you don't have any exuberance for these things? No. You, you, again, it's okay to be happy and glad. These things, and I think it's working on this lowly shema, not for its own sake level, because it says, "For your reward is great in heaven." Though. You could argue with me and say, where is their reward great? In heaven. In heaven. You know where their reward is not great? On earth. It might be that this So okay, so let's define heaven, right? So when when he uses the word heaven here, what does he mean by heaven? And when he also says that your reward will be great in heaven, aren't they making assumptions that in heaven, or if there's a place called heaven, um, that um you know, that, um, like, what is the word? So, so again, like, I, I feel like sometimes I, I push you to try to define a word. So I think it's fair for you to push me back. Yeah. To define a so word. Now, because it, I think heaven, we, like, it means like somewhere of God, whatever you happen when you're dead. Okay. So I'm surprised it did not say the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, because all of the other places it speaks about the kingdom of heaven. Right. Now, this is, um, as in, a, as in a, a future tense, it's a place in the future. But that kingdom of heaven is on earth. This this line, your reward is great. Uh, I think it literally means not on earth. That's what we're really saying. It's saying that when you feel persecution, when you feel tortured, when you feel attacked, your those might be afflictions that you have to experience on earth. But you may be the downtrodden on earth because you will not get that reward until the next life. And it almost is a justification for the downtrodden nature. Of Christianity at certain time periods. Let's see. For so the persecuted. It works on those two levels, though. You know, your reward in heaven, it's say, number one, your reward, it's a person who, who needs to hear that he's getting reward, but also works on a level that your reward in heaven as opposed to on earth. Okay. For so the persecuted, the, the prophets who are before you. Right. Yeah, so this is, yeah. So this, this is one of the things that um, when we talk about Christianity, a lot of times it has this, this weird relationship to the prophets before. But we do understand that the prophets before, as I mentioned to you, were a somewhat of, at least like once we get to the finish of the Pentateuch, were somewhat of a failed venture. The prophets were the people who begged and pleaded for the Jews, the Israelites, to lead a better life. Mm -hmm. And the only time I even think about when they're fully successful was when Jonah went to the people of Nineveh, the non-Jews, mm -hmm. and, and they, they were, but if you look at what, how successful Samuel was, or how successful Isaiah or Jeremiah, or, you know, Amos, a lot of times these people are unsuccessful people. 
So when it says in the same way that in the end of the day, the people who were persecuted the most was like Isaiah. The people looked at them like they were nutballs, like they were crazy because they were speaking from the God perspective. Is that is that what's been my persecution? It's, it's looking, looking at them with contempt. Now, I, 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 I assume persecution to me physical harm, as in threatening to hurt somebody or physically or causing, causing, causing them physical harm. So if they, if they look if they look uh, at that. We don't, I don't know the Greek. You know, it says persecution. And we spoke about in the last verse where we see that people revile you, people uh, persecute you and, and utter all kinds. We said that was a, 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 a gradation, so going up the ladder. But the word persecute doesn't inherently mean physical. Persecute, you could persecute someone uh, verbally. So um, I, because I'm just using the English word, uh, I, I just feel persecute can mean both. It might be in the Greek word. It means more specifically only physical. I can't, I can't tell you for sure. But what we do see for sure in this is that we were to understand all of a sudden that out of nowhere, that the prophets were a failed venture, that the prophets were a group of people who, who never were, like, like you can imagine if you're a, a prophet's belief, you'll stand on a mountain, your face will shine, you'll give your blessing and everyone will listen to you. But what we see here is it's really interesting that not only are the Christians going to be persecuted, but they're going to follow a long line of persecuted prophets. The people who represent God are the people who are always on the wrong side of history. They're the people who are always getting attacked. The people who stand for truth will be the people yeah, who the get best, persecuted. The best example would be John the Baptist. We don't even have to go that far to the Old Testament of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Amos. What about John the Baptist, right? I mean, people looked at him. I mean, he was, in some ways, he was a failure in some ways, right? I mean, well, what, uh, what I'm interested is that, in, again, like, I don't, it's funny because I generally don't view John the Baptist as persecuted. Yeah. Because if anything, we see in Matthew and in Luke, the crowds and or Sadducees and or Pharisees are going to listen to him. We don't hear any negativity. The only thing we happen to know is the murderous king murdered him. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I feel when a murderous king murders you, you are 100% are persecuted in that moment. But I feel when the prophets are persecuted, they're, per they're, they're persecuted systemically by all the people. I see. So I don't view it again, like you're right 100% that he was persecuted. But I, I generally don't view him on my list of the persecuted. So, so in a, by the definition, we say that Jesus was persecuted? The Pharisees didn't listen. Didn't listen to him. They probably argued with him back and forth. Uh, I, I think that, and so, yeah, that Jesus is meant to be viewed as a as the persecuted par excellence. That's the whole point of the passion to say it's not that he was persecuted. You can't imagine a person persecuted like Jesus. Like Jesus. That's, okay. that's the point of the passion. For again, like you know, for better or worse, whatever they're trying to accomplish, that his persecution was unlike any other persecution. And I think his persecution does fall in line in a more qualitatively more strong way than the other uh, prophets. Like, you know, other prophets were beaten. Other prophets walked around naked. Other prophets wore, wore sackcloth and they had these negative relations and yelled at. Um, so again, I just, it depends on how you view that. But so, so it's persecution, right? Is this just a human condition? <laughs> or is this because of because of them being prophets? They were, they, because they were prophets, they were persecuted. So, so um, could you could you expand on that? I mean, is well, it... I mean, like I don't have an answer. Yeah, I mean, everyone's persecuted at some point. You get married, you get persecuted, right? <laughs> so, so I don't know. I, I mean, bilaterally, you know, I'll, I'll say the persecution goes both ways. But yeah, a persecution. You know, when when a Venus flytrap e eats uh, or or closes his mouth on a bee, was the bee persecuted? When a lion kills a deer, was it persecuted? When a teacher castigates a student? Yeah, well, I didn't mean it that way, right? So in, in the context of this persecution, we saw as well as in being, being opposed to the message, but life was a failure, right? Or, or nobody took them seriously. They, 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 they took these prophets to be idiots yeah, in some ways, okay, literally like, speaking. I'm so to, I'm not trying to make endless sweeping statements. I, I think that they're a failed venture in that Jonah was a successful one. And I think everyone kind of doesn't live up to Jonah Hall. If you look at one of the greatest failures, right, was Moses. God says to Moses, You will not enter me, this land. Yeah. Let me forget about Moses. No, I'm saying let, let me kill all these people mm -hmm. after and let me start all over with you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he he literally the, the, his flock, God's like, your flock sucks. Let me start all over. But you know, Moses defends, Aaron defends, and, and they kind of come out on the other end. But what we see here is for in the same way they persecute the prophets who are before you, I, I do think this kind of persecution is um, 
I view it as more of a philosophical persecution, that there's people on the right side of history who we call like the, the people who represent God, mm -hmm. the people who have the God goggles on, and then there are the people who are on the other side. These people have an ideological or a philosophical persecution and that every moment of their existence, they're always kind of feeling that they're cast away that to the other. I always look at these bad beatitudes as how Jesus, I, I keep saying this, but how Jesus represents the other, how Jesus represents the not cool kid and how he's trying to kind of collect the not cool kids to be on his team. And those prophets, uh, his predecessors were all team Jesus in this way. They were always on the side of history, not representing the majority. They always represent the minority. They always try to represent God. God is never in the majority. You know, unless you want to say after the kingdom of heaven are Christians, God is always representing the people who, who can't see the whole see the whole whole path there's a famous line that in the in the messianic times that knowledge will be uh on the surface of the earth like water knowledge will be oh, yeah. so like, 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 like water and you shy Leibowitz always points out he goes you mean that's never going to happen because you can never have a time period where knowledge is really going to be as prevalent as water on the ocean because that's not human nature that's not how humans work humans are always going to go after their their lowest <laughs> and basis elements. And there's going to be people on the other side of the line saying, don't do that. So I think Jesus is always on the other side. And again, this has to do with his whole messianic, um, his, his whole picture. Is Jesus, is the goal of Jesus to say the kingdom of heaven is here and therefore you all have to be on my side or is the kingdom here? He's always going to tell you, I'm always going to be on the side and try to drag you along to the other side. And I think it's two different kinds of me uh, messiahships. Again, Judaism and imagines the Messiah coming and that line disappearing. God is so clear on earth that everything is perfect clarity. We never see that in Jesus' life or today. There's always this idea that Jesus is on the other side of the fence and he's always dragging us to the other side of the fence and we're never going to get there. Well, at least not in this lifetime. Right. Okay, well, but, but, but you could, even well, before Jesus was here, you could say that. We're well, never... I mean, yeah, I mean, so let me qualify. I mean, I, yesterday after you said, the only distinction I would make is we are called to, to we are called by the work of the Spirit uh, to work towards bringing that heaven. Are you, at least, so we might not be successful in, in all we do, but we are called to give it our best. And, and do what, you know, we're called to do our best and to... Right, um, that, that's such a different messianic picture. That's what we're saying. That there's one messianic picture where knowledge is on earth like water, and another mm -hmm. one where knowledge is still so minute, it's only in Jesus' head and the prophets, and you're always still mm -hmm. dragging the masses along with you. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, Isaac, I think we're done with the Beatitudes. Uh, the sermon goes on for a couple more chapters. Yeah, but, uh, I think we are. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, what is the biggest takeaway from this Beatitudes? From these, from these, where if you had to pick out right the biggest takeaway, because as we noticed, like, these, these these are hard to. The way attain. you're living your nope. life will never get you to the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> the, the, Not you, but yeah, in general. These are hard to attain. Nobody can attain all these. You know, all these ten, seven, eight, or ten, however they counted. But we are called to make progress. We try. We are called to to strive to have the humility of heart and spirit to try to to you know to uh, to at least desire to be that. So. At the end of all this, what is the biggest takeaway? Or what do you so, think? I is... mean, that's the takeaway for me that um, they, there's an ideal person and we're, we're kind of, there's always like this barrier for us to see things through Jesus's eyes. And he lists those barriers and how you're just never going to get there because you're so manipulated and twisted by the reality that you've experienced. I think that's that's a very Christian thing to say. I think it's a very Christian thing to say that this speaks about sin with a capital S. But as a Jew, right? As 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 a Jew reading this, what does this tell you? Does it even mean like what would be your? Oh no! As a Jew, this is again. I don't mean to be negative, but, but it's kind of like a meaningless thing to us. It feels like poetry. It feels like a person who was. This is gonna sound horrible. I don't mean it sounds so negative, but. Uh, it's, it feels like, you know, when you get a poet who no one understands him and you're not even sure he understands it himself, <laughs> you know, like, like, you know, he says, you know, when he says something so abstract, you're like, are you sure that you know what you're talking about? So it kind of feels like that way. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs. Like, I feel like as we talk about the people who heard this the first time, I think they would have been like, good stuff, you know, but that would have been, that would have been it. Like, there's nothing more you can get out of that. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs>
<laughs> well, Rabbi, well, on that note, I think this will be a good place to stop and lots to think and ponder. And uh, well, we've completed the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Mount, or, or the Beatitudes, I should say. I and... cannot wait to get to some parables about salt. Yeah. I'll be right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Okay. Uh, great. Okay. Speak to you soon. Uh, yeah.